Good evening, and welcome to the University of St. Thomas and the Opus College of Business. I'm Stephanie Lenway, and I used to be the new dean of the Opus College, so I've gotten a promotion. Now I'm just the dean. It's very cool. So it's a great place. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, well, I don't know many of you, but I, I am. I, my story is I arrived in Minneapolis 30 years ago. And 10 years ago, I got lost and wandered off to do a tour of academic institutions in the Midwest. And um, then I came back. So it's great to be back, and it's great to be at the University of St. Thomas. Uh, the program is as follows. I'm going to introduce Dr. Penny Wheeler, who will talk about the evening. Then I'm going to introduce Senator Dave Durenberger, who will do his symposium. <laughs> and then there'll be questions, so please think about them. I used to teach strategy. That means I call on people. <laughs> so. Please prepare your questions. So Dr. Wheeler is president and chief clinical officer of Alina Health. She said, don't say much. I will say her undergraduate and uh, MDs are from the University of Minnesota. And she practices uh, obstetrics. I don't know. I'm a social scientist. Is that good? And she works on quality in collaboration with many, including the medical staff, the Alina Board of Directors, Physician Governance Council, and medical directors. So welcome, Penny. Thanks. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'm really looking forward to tonight. And, and I want to tell you, you know, uh, that this is the Bill Peterson. Uh, lecture, and I want to tell you why that is, and and why it's such a privilege to honor Bill. And I'll say I'll, I'll save the introduction for Senator Durenberger to you, but I'll say a couple words about him too, and then we're in for a treat with Senator Durenberger, um, you know, giving the speech tonight. So first, you know, Bill Peterson, you know, it's a delight to honor you. Bill was the chief medical officer for Alina Health and preceded me by a few years, but. Uh, was the reason, really, quite honestly, that my group, an obstetrical gynecology group, uh, wanted and looked forward to being part of Abbott Northwestern Hospital and the Alina Health System. And uh, we put every ingredient into how to be the best physician leader that you could possibly be, and we put it into a computer program, and the picture on the screen looked like Bill Peterson. <laughs> so uh, I couldn't find a better mentor, a more incredible human being than Bill. And to honor him with this lecture and have the foundation honor him in this way and to have you support this, Bill, means the world to us. Uh, thank you for all that you've given to everybody for many, many years. And, and uh, we wouldn't be uh, where we were today without your mentorship and your leadership in this community. So I thank you, Bill, very much. And I don't think there's anybody that you could be more excited about giving this lecture than Senator Durenberger. You know, and I won't say much about Senator Durenberger because I know that's coming. Uh, but I will say that I was lucky enough that Senator Durenberger agreed to and, and was part of our Alina Board of Directors. And I can say that I live and breathe healthcare every day and for usually about 14 hours of that day. Um, but uh, I know about as much about healthcare policy, uh, you know, he knows as much about I do in his pinky than I do in all of mine. So it's a, just a delight to have him. And I think that, Bill, you were more than pleased that the senator was able to give this lecture tonight on our behalf. So thank you, Senator Durenberger. Thanks, Penny. So I have a biography of Senator Durenberger, which I will read in a minute. But I just thought I'd share a short experience I had this evening. So I walk in to this room and say, good evening, Senator. And he says, hi, boss. How many people get that from us? I think it's pretty cool. So the other thing you should know is uh, his wife was my teacher. 
So when I was in graduate school, which we won't talk about when that was, but so we've been indirectly related for quite a few years. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Senator Durenberger. Many of you know he went to St. John's Prep. Uh, anybody here go to St. John's Prep? Great institution. And he went to the university. He served as an army officer and then went to the University of Minnesota where he got his law degree. He went to work for H.B. Fuller, the glue company up the road. And in 1978, was elected to the Senate where he served three terms. In 1995, he retired from the Senate and came to the University of St. Thomas as a senior health policy fellow. <clears throat> He's married to Susan Foote. Between them, they have six children and 12 grandchildren, and they split their time between St. Paul and San Rafael, where else? So Dave's had a lot of experiences with healthcare in private and public service. He's been a consumer, a buyer, a payer, and a reformer. And he has worked for reform with Dr. Peterson, for whom this symposium is named. <laughs> Tonight, Dave's going to talk about healthcare reform, talk about some of the people and the leadership in healthcare reform, and maybe say a few words about bipartisan uh, accommodation. I don't know how to say that, but bipartisanship and the possibilities of future healthcare. So, welcome, Senator Durenberger. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, very much. Um, and thanks to all of you for being here this evening as well. Um, I must say, it is a genuine honor to be asked to deliver this 15th of the Peterson Lectures. Um, and uh, I'm glad that um, you took the opportunity to introduce me by referring to the fact that once you were one of student, Susan, my wife's uh, students, because it allows me to say, Susan isn't here tonight because she's babysitting in San Anselmo, California, where the temperature is not quite as low as it is here. Uh, but she'll be back shortly, and she, if she knew you were going to be here, she'd love to have had the opportunity for me to say just what I said, that she wishes she were here. Uh, and Penny, thank you very much for introducing Bill by way of his background. And um, all I want to say to the people at um, Alina Health, Abbott Northwestern Hospital, the Abbott Northwestern Hospital Foundation, is how wise you were to create this lecture at the Opus College of Business uh, to honor the co-commitment of these two institutions to the future of physician leadership of health, of health care, and of health policy in Minnesota and the upper Midwest, and to say that you couldn't have chosen a better role model than Bill Peterson. To put uh, our backgrounds in perspective, just a little louder, oh, okay. Oh, just bring it up a little bit. Okay. Well, if I were sitting out there, I'd be having a hard time too. Okay. Um, I wanted to put the two of us in some kind of perspective, although we have a slight difference in age. Um, Bill was 43, age 43, and in his 11th year at Abbott, back in the year 1965, when Medicare and Medicaid were created. A year later, 1966, <coughs> I became the 32-year-old executive secretary to the newly elected Republican governor of Minnesota, Harold Lavander. This was just as Medicare, Medicaid, and all the rest of the great society programs were being implemented. Bill and I were each challenged in our own venues to make sense out of what was likely to happen when a fee-for-service healthcare financing system met a deluge of newly insured, older, disabled, and low-income 
America. Well, it happened, <laughs> and we were. By 1970, Fortune magazine informed us that American business was becoming alarmed at the cost consequences to employers as national health care spending reached $100 billion in one year. So Bill and I chose in our own ways to become part of the solution rather than part of the problem, which is eventually what brought us together here at the University of St. Thomas. About the time I decided to retire from the Senate in 1994, Bill retired from Alina to the Opus College of Business to help create what has become a nationally renowned physician leadership college. And he was aided and abetted in that work by the doctor that he most admired in this community and the man that he wanted to be his doctor, Dr. Richard Fry. Then along came Dr. Brian Campion and the series of others who followed him. And today, the St. Thomas Leadership College has become and promises to be tomorrow a forum for some of the best healthcare innovators in this country. Thanks to you. So here the two of us are 20 years later, way past the age that uh, health policy guru, guru Zeke Emanuel, in his new book, Life Ends at 75, suggests <laughs> should have ended our careers. I'm here as an unabashed admirer of Minnesota physicians because their leadership in health improvement, disease prevention, in patient-oriented healthcare, medical research, and innovation, and in healthcare financing and delivery reform has always served to inform the nation with the potential of high value healthcare in America. Leadership. <coughs> Robert Greenleaf says of leadership in times like we live in today, and I quote him, a leader without followers is just another guy out for a walk, end quote. And it makes me, of course, think of members of Congress. The last public opinion poll showed the public confidence in our Congress at 14% among you and me. But I'm here to tell you, 91% of them are going to get elected or reelected. That's Greenleaf's definition. Leaders without followers. And I won't try to elaborate on that because I can tell by your body language, you know exactly what I'm talking about and it's hard to think about. So, to the point of my little talk tonight. When President Clinton's efforts to reform a healthcare system failed in 1994, my good friend, Senator Howell Heflin, the senior senator from Alabama, told us he'd heard that when famous health reformer Claude Pepper, the congressman from Florida, died, he went straight to heaven because he was such a great believer in health reform. Looked for God, found him, and said, are we ever going to have health reform in the United States of America? To which God replied, I have good news and bad news. The good news is, yes, you will. And the bad news is, not in my lifetime. <laughs> and that's just the way most people have reacted. <laughs> so I'm here to tell you that that apocryphal God was wrong. We did it. We manifested it in 2010 at a national level but we're doing it as a thing we do in Minnesota. If anybody here is in that, uh, you know, 46% of Americans who currently, in the latest Gallup poll, say they think Obamacare is gonna hurt them rather than help them, I have to try to convince you tonight to get over to the 36% of us, which is up from 27%, who think it's going to help you. And that's my job. I learned early and uh, from people much older than I and more experienced that this is a nation of a unique system of intergovernmental relations where both the urgency to act nationally and the acquired experience of professional and volunteer leadership starts locally. It doesn't start in Washington, D.C. And only then, when it becomes a movement at the local level, does it work its way to national policy through the election of caring, inquisitive, and informed leaders who have belief systems about the appropriate role of government. Some will say more government, some will say less. 
When voters elect people about whom they can say, as many said to me, I don't always agree with you, but I always know where you stand, then we'll know. We'll know. We have somebody we can vote for and we can count on. For as long as I can recall, Minnesota has been engaged in a community-wide effort to improve the delivery and financing of health care and to extend the benefits of affordable access to everyone in this state. We have been taxing ourselves for a long time to do just that. Because of the complexity of health care and the wide variety of experiences that each of us has with it, physician leadership has been critical to the change for the better. And so, too, is well-trained and innovative management, involvement by employers and by employee unions on behalf of reform, and by the bipartisan efforts of policy reformers. So my message is simple. From the bottom of my heart, Bill, thank you. Thank you. It is because of the leadership of physicians like you, and now I can say the ones that I have had the privilege to teach in this college for the last uh, 20 years. And this goes way back to the two male boys that left Lesur, my dad's hometown, for Rochester. That all of America is today engaged in much more than just another effort at health reform. We're creating a uniquely American health system that will play to our values as a nation and our strengths as a nation. And we're building it on the foundations already laid in communities like our own, by physician leaders like ours, from Hawaii and the Pacific Northwest to the Middle West and New England. Because for much too long, Americans have needed a health care system that they as individuals and families and we as a nation could afford. With the conviction of an experienced belief, I can say the path to reform, to change into better health and more affordable health care for all Americans must pass through every community in America, where it becomes the task of local health care leaders not unfamiliar with that challenge. And in a minute, I'm going to explain why that is. But I want to make the point that if Massachusetts and Minnesota can't get even close to affordable, transparent reform without national policy changes, especially in insurance, social insurance, public assistance, tax policy, then nobody can do it. So expecting us to do this one state at a time is not going to make it happen. We needed that legislation, and we can improve it, as I will point out a little later. And that's especially true because too many states in this country have refused to expand coverage to their own citizens because they could always ship their uninsured costs to the rest of us across this nation. So it's time for every state to learn the lessons of affordable health care. Not from partisans or physicians, excuse me, not from partisans or physicians who prefer the rewards of the past or biased think tanks, but from the men and the women who have chosen to become physicians, nurses, and other health professionals in a time of change. And I offer you as proof the 3,700 men and women who applied for 232 admission slots at the University of Minnesota Medical School this year, knowing, knowing that this year's graduates <laughs> went away with an average $186,000 in debt. If that isn't a tribute to the women and men who believe that they may be at the right place, at the right time, with the right heart, as well as the right mind, for a better, healthy America, a healthier America. I don't know what there is. Now, why better health and health care one American community at a time? Let's take a large community like the Upper Midwest as an example. Health care as a public good came to this part of America with immigrants mostly from socially conscious Northern European, Northern Europe, and they began here in church-related charitable hospitals. And they left us a legacy of stewardship in our not-for-profit hospitals, in our health professions education, and in professional practice, and in our communities, including, in my day, employers and employee unions 
committed to making health care available and affordable for everyone. Community stewardship adopts readily to a moral mandate for change, for leadership, to change, and for good public policy. And we're not unique. The instinct for community exists everywhere in America. The leadership may not. So it'll simply take longer in some places than in others. And frankly, it's going to be more difficult to be the first to begin the work it takes to change a nation. The financial rewards for the early adapters or the early leaders may not be as great in proportion to their effort as it may be for the followers. So I ask you to think Jesus' parable of the landowner who hired workers for his vineyard, you know? Some went out at six in the morning and some went out at three in the afternoon and they all got the same pay, that one. Remember, we're doing God's work. <laughs> we're doing God's work in all of this. Being the first. Maybe tough, but it's God's work. Experience tells me that success then and now depends on bringing physicians into leadership opportunities in health systems, like the president. I was so happy to vote that day. President of Alina for Penny Wheeler. <laughs> they make their colleagues' strengths effective and their weaknesses irrelevant because they're changing behavior. They make their colleagues' strengths effective and their weaknesses irrelevant. Warren Buffett says it's taking complex issues and simplifying them, and the best physicians know how. Dr. Paul Batalden from Park Nicollet, then Dartmouth, now St. Anthony Park, who retires this year as board chair of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, believes that all health reform is local because change begins always with a different idea. Somebody has a new idea, a different idea, and becomes real when it informs local practice of the better professionals, and is followed by aligning the payment incentives on the insurance side with those on the physician side. Former Alida CEO Dick Pettengill believes an organization with the potential for great leadership provides physicians with effective tools. For example, the informatics capacity to change behavior, the opportunity for research and education, and a sense of economic security. Batalden says, plus the ability to say yes when asked three very important questions. Are you treated with dignity and respect every day by everyone, even though you're not be at the top of the hierarchy? Am I given what I need to make a contribution that gives meaning to my life? And does somebody notice it? <laughs> my physician mentors have taught me as well that good leaders learn to give credit away in exchange for getting something done right. Not always easy for some generations of physicians, I must say. No less an expert than former CMS head and IHI founder, who's also spoken here, Don Berwick, believes health reform is the largest single value growth opportunity in America during the next decade. Experts estimate waste, inefficiency, and outright health care fraud cost $12,844.30 per year per family of four. Coverage expansion is critical because 10% of the average health insurance premium today funds cross-subsidies cost for the care of the uninsured and the underinsured. Berwick sees communities across this country running a series of clinical trials, the success of which will depend on people like those in this room tonight, whose results will be closely watched by others, seeking to shortcut their own efforts to build value. Berwick estimates, as a matter of fact, 80% of value growth will come from these clinical trials, and 20% from encouraging creativity among professionals in each organization. There's another reason we change one community at a time. Thanks to the ACA, America for the first time has national goals for health policy to help take the partisan bias out of policymaking. Chief among those goals are healthy people, healthy communities, and a value-driven health care and health insurance system. Meaning, we each benefit 
from the commitment to responsible health habits of all of us, and from our joint efforts to reduce the impact of poverty, homelessness, family disintegration, addiction, mental health illness, poor education, and the cost of public safety and health care. This, gentlemen and women, is a task for communities, led by health care, employer, religious, public leaders, eager to use our performance to influence state and national policy. I uh, brought a photo. Yeah, okay. This is uh, a photo of a man who became the chair of the United States Senate Finance Committee's Health Care Subcommittee in the year 1981. And this is a picture of him at one of those meetings. And I wanted to make a point about why getting public policy right in a country like the United States may be frustrating to position leaders like Bill. The object in uh, this guy's right hand is a pipe. Not the kind most of you were raised on, but this is a tobacco. It, we, we smoke tobacco in these pipes like the Native Americans did. Um, not uh, the predecessor, this fellow's predecessor, Senator Herman Talmadge of Georgia, chose to smoke cigars at subcommittee hearings and at full committee hearings. And the point is this. When making public policy in a representative democracy like ours, what the elected leader sees depends on where he stands. And as I will illustrate, with whom he and she is willing to stand. It means that when you see what you see depends on where you're from and what community values, experience, and ideologic beliefs relative to the role of government you bring to public service. America is as diverse as the values of the immigrants who originally settled various parts of this country, from the French in the north to the Spaniards and the West Indian slave owners in the south, plus English immigrants from a wide variety of economic and cultural classes and religious traditions who sought either refuge or opportunity in this nation. Because we were founded in liberty, in the equal rights of most all citizens, and in representative federalism, these original values have persisted despite waves of new immigration. This makes national consensus <coughs> on anything except national security crises or some other national crises a real challenge. To be met best by pragmatic, not ideological leadership. But back to this photo. In 1981, many American physicians in most of the country had stopped allowing themselves and their profession to be used to sell cigarettes. I said, many. Many had learned enough to stop smoking entirely. And Minnesota physicians like Stuart Hansen were leading a national campaign to use health policy to end smoking entirely in 1981. <laughs> but the message had not yet made it to either the senator from Georgia or the senator from Minnesota, as is obvious from this picture. I quit the pipe in 1984. That was about the same time that my Democratic colleague, Frank Lautenberg of New Jersey, began an effort to end smoking on airplanes. <laughs> I know some of you don't believe that. <laughs> this was not that long ago. So it's with good health policy. So it is with good health policy in this country. It's not easy. And we're just talking about staying alive, right? It's even more challenging to convert health care practice into national policy, because what's unaffordable expense to most of us has become the economic lifestyle of the average physician. Physicians are critical to providing leadership toward a better and healthier America. It is today to whom we have always turned for advice, just like we turn to teachers for better education, to government leaders to provide the benefits of public services, like health, health care, and elementary education. In a business school, many might argue that health care services could best be delivered in a competitive marketplace. And philosophically, I totally agree. If we were able to use government to set the rules for competition and to finance those market components, essential to high quality, but markets don't, or rarely do, such as health, disability, and medical research, health professions, education, 
high quality, equally accessible price and performance information. The historic dysfunction in fee-for-service medical markets creates under, undeserved financial rewards for iterative improvement in medical technology, and it's used by physicians for an ill-informed patient population. Physicians who develop financial interests in the product, manufacture, and in its rapid dissemination. Many, many policy changes, like effectiveness research, have been incredibly difficult to finance because manufacturers objected. But the Founding Fathers anticipated this, <coughs> that making national policy can be difficult outside of a crisis, even when it's essential for the common good. I was introduced to the United States Senate um, shortly after my election in 1978 when I chose membership on the Senate Finance Committee, got a nice handwritten note from Russell Long, the Democratic chairman of the committee. And in it, he traces the relationship between Minnesota and Louisiana going all the way back to Thomas Jefferson's decision to buy Louisiana from the French, uh, 1803. So I asked him, what did that mean? And he says, well, uh, this year we're in energy crises. All the oil companies have raised their prices. We're going to have a windfall profits tax in front of the committee. And all my constituents produce is oil and gas, and all yours do is consume it. <laughs> so guess who wins? And I, I sort of politely smiled, and I did, couldn't figure out where this was going, except I was surprised when I found out where it went. He said, fortunately, the Founding Fathers made sure there were two of us in each state. And by the time all 50 states are heard from, we get good national energy policy, because it's good for my constituents and it's good for yours. A lesson I'll never forget, because that's the way the United States Senate was designed <laughs> to work. Two years after my election, Ronald Reagan was elected president. Republicans elected to a majority in the Senate for the first time in decades. Pragmatic Republicans like Bob Dole, Bob Packwood of Oregon, John Chafee of Rhode Island, Jack Danforth of Missouri, dominated the new majority. Minority Democrats that have gone into a funk like Senator Long, Lloyd Benson of Texas, Pat Moynihan of New York, and Bill Bradley of New Jersey, knew from experience where and how to meet us to shape the consensus legislation that we needed to achieve a majority vote on the Senate floor. One of our colleagues, Dick Schweiker of Pennsylvania, was appointed Secretary of HHS. In 1982, we on the committee launched a 10-year effort to change health policy by reforming the nation's largest health care program, Medicare. We learned from health professionals and health service researchers who were advocates of health system change. We watched financing reform experiments where they occurred in what came to be called the states that can't wait. Budget deficits, generational equity drove us to initiate policy reform. So early on, we developed guiding principles for change. Change to national health policy to help us deal with seemingly intractable issues for the average uh, elected member of the Congress of health care cost, inefficiency, inequity, and all the causing factors. We counseled with public policy foundations, which were truly independent of politics. Policy change always met pressure to maintain the status quo on public spending policy from a growing number of physician specialty associations, fearful of the consequences of change to their membership <laughs> from changes in public policy. So we hired professional staff, experienced with health policy, not with partisan politics. My first two health staffers were both physicians, John Tillotson from Minneapolis, and then Dick Krugman from Denver, most recently the vice president of the Academic Medical Center at the University of, of Colorado in Denver. We spent time at home and at the invitation of our colleagues in their home states, with health professionals respected by their peers as leaders for change in health care improvement and financing. In 1983, we authorized the Medicare prospective payment system for 468 hospital admissions called DRGs. At the same time, we prepared to launch what turned out to be a highly successful experiment to privatize Medicare in states like Hawaii, Oregon, Washington, California, Utah, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Vermont, called the HMO cost contract demo. In 1988, we passed the first comprehensive reform of Medicare since its founding, then added catastrophic, it added catastrophic coverage, prescription drugs, and some long-term care benefits, bringing Medicare in line with many private insurance benefits. It happened to get repealed the next year <coughs> by 
public pressure only because we ask those with incomes over $80,000 to pay, to pay a proportionate share of the new costs, of the new benefits, which today, of course, is an accepted part of the Medicare program. But then it was new, and I remember getting 46 votes on the floor of the Senate not to repeal, and I couldn't get past 46. <laughs> so when you look at the record, it'll say like 36 or 35, because 11 people peeled back and made it look as though they were for the repeal. But anyway, 46 had the guts. In all of this and more, we were all motivated by the belief that the genius of American medicine, properly incentivized, as it expanded medical research and discovery, would never produce a healthcare system twice as costly and half as productive as the average of all developed nations in the world. The question <laughs> was only <coughs> how do we get from here to there <laughs> and when? So, in 1992, Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton was elected president on his pledge to provide health insurance to every American at an affordable price to the country. Instead of using what was by then a Senate House bipartisan reform blueprint, Hillary Clinton set up her own, where's Dan McLaughlin? 500 person, including Dan McLaughlin, shop, which produced, despite the fact that you were there, uh, you were a hospital administrator at the time or something, yeah, you had a special interest. Uh, <laughs> Produce lots of change, but little or no affordability. <laughs> pragmatic Senate Republicans, John Chafee and I, along with pragmatic Democrat John Bro of Louisiana, formed the mainstream group, which eventually numbered 27 senators from both parties, including all of those who were most respected for their track records in designing health policy. And we set to work to save reform from the Clintons and from the movement by conservative Newt Gingrich Republicans in the Congress to oppose anything the president proposed. Remind you of another year, huh? Much of our consensus work product was in the bro dernberger bill introduced in the sum in late summer of 1994. It failed to pass, but, and this is critical to understand, our legislation, along with other mainstream work done by Senators Chafee and Bourne of o Oklahoma, became the foundation for what we're gonna talk about next, November 2008. The old American economy, on which all of us were raised, was failing. It was losing us, the country, 700,000 jobs a month, and something we now call the Great Recession. Healthcare costs were approaching $3 trillion a year, sucking up 18% of our economy. Americans, including 50 million healthcare uninsured and 75 million underinsured, made history by electing a president who promised change we could believe in. By December, the Democratic and Republican leaders of the Senate Finance Committee produced a 95-page bipartisan framework for comprehensive reform, Grassley and Baucus, that they had worked on together since 2003, evolved from state experiments and think tank analysis built on the 1994 mainstream policy consensus. On March 4th of 2009, President Barack Obama invited the leaders of 150 of the nation's health industry associations to the White House, and he received from them by the end of the day their commitment to contribute whatever they could to changing the health care cost curve. For the first time in its more than 100 year history, the American Medical Association went on record supporting national reform in exchange for expanded insurance coverage built on the, Democrat, on the December Senate consensus and the resulting work of the gang of six Republican and Democratic senators. By early summer, the House passed it as the Affordable Care Act, with but one Republican vote. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell of Kentucky then declared it his National Party's goal to make Barack Obama a one-term president, making it clear that no Republican in Congress or in state government would support any Obama health reform. The Senate's bipartisan effort collapsed, and all of the rest is history, including the fact that the Democratic members of Congress, of the House, having pinned every member's future to the success of health reform, compelled their president to see it through to the signing of two new laws on March 23rd, 2010, called Obamacare by both sides. In the process, Democrats did something no one expected them ever to do. And Republicans 
blinded by the sight of Obamacare blood in the water, were unwilling to take advantage of. Democrats in the United States had just rejected the health policy course followed by liberals and by every other developed nation in the world to a single payer or government cost controlled health care system using insurance or not using insurance. Democrats in Congress at that time challenged Republicans and all of us Americans to join in creating a genuinely American health system. Which brings us to where we are in October 2014. In the age of Obamacare, health reform that will not be derailed by elections. Despite the temptation of campaign signs like, keep your doctor, change your congressman, <laughs> or keep your insurance, change your senator. We are at the Opus College of Business, the University of St. Thomas, striving to teach the business of healthcare to students who grew up in the old American health system, in which hospital charge masters determine medical service prices. And something called this is not a bill still determines insurance payments. Where scope of practice barriers make it difficult for med medical education leaders to prepare the next generation of physician, nurse, and other health professionals. And with a state legislature that invests hundreds of millions of dollars creating a medical destination city to benefit one of several competing not-for-profit health organizations. And the Attorney General chases a large health system that does business in our state out of the metropolitan Minneapolis-St. Paul area. So, I ask you to listen up. <laughs> we are also at the end of a decade in which employer, and this is a tough decade we've been in for business and everyone else, employer contributions to family health insurance coverage rose from $7,289 a year to $12,011. Small businesses can't afford health care coverage to say it's nothing of the Targets and the Walmarts and God knows who. And, sadly, Healthcare costs have become a key driver in income inequality. So, we have no choice. We have no choice but to become believers and doers and leaders ourselves. Back in 1983, when we created and passed the Medicare DRG financing, I went to the Texas Heart Center to explain what we'd done at their invitation. And I recall, well, after all my explanation and everything, there was about a 75-year-old doc in scrubs with the name Michael DeBakey on his little <laughs> scrub jacket there, who put up his hand. He says, I know everything there is to know about health care. I go all over the world on this subject. And what, you're, what, you're been, what you guys think you're going to sell us is a whole bunch of crap. <laughs> oh, I said, well, being from Stearns County, I didn't know how to deal with that. And I said, well, doctor, you may be right, or I may be right, or whatever. But I... <laughs> I will never forget. Um, so I thought uh, seeking friendlier uh, territory, I went up to St. Cloud. <laughs> I gave the same pitch as St. Cloud at the, in the board meeting. And uh, the Benedictine nun who was CEO listened politely and then she said, David, you were born in this hospital. How can you do this to us? <laughs> at that point, you know, at that point I knew DRGs had to be a means to an end, but not an end in themselves. It's entirely possible that, plus RBRVS with SGR, or even managed care organizations, just weren't the magic bullet. And it's always possible that the business of healthcare isn't either. Back in the days when I was referred to by some in Congress as the senator from Mayo, or the senator, or the HMO senator, I would never have predicted that Minnesota could have a WNBA team called the Mayo Clinic Lynx. <laughs> On the other hand, Chris Snowbeck reported yesterday in the Tribune that the Mayo Clinic has the message. They got the message from the first round of health insurance, revelation, uh, exchange revelations, a narrow network, deal they cut with Medica, which, you know, Narrow network of some kind. It doesn't, you know, he doesn't get into all the details because they probably don't give them to him. But anyway, it's a southeastern. It's an option for people who live in southeastern Minnesota to be able to afford it at something closer to the prices that people up here pay. So somebody's, you know, maybe, maybe this business something's working around here. So we don't know. So 
here's the way that one person at least looks at health reform. The new CMS head uh, of insurance exchanges said, to use a baseball analogy for health reform, we're in the top of the third of a nine inning baseball game. But he too is guessing. Because nothing this audacious, you know, getting $3 trillion worth of value out of a three, you know, $3 trillion system has never been tried. The ACA provides the financial incentives for the architecture of an American system. If you're a reformer or in the business of adopting, adopting the reform, I think you know that. So here's a suggestion for you and your elected representatives. Sometime early next year, I'd love to see the health industry leaders who went to the White House back in March of 2009 ask President Obama to call another meeting. And this time include the congressional leaders he spent an entire day with at Blair House in February of 2010. And then throw in some more experienced governors from both parties. Pick governors who aren't running for president yet, that would be helpful. They are likely to be more Republicans in leadership than five years earlier, but seasoned Republicans who have been in leadership or ranking position today on relevant health committees know they aren't going to repeal health reform. <laughs> they can hurt health reform by repealing Obamacare, and they understand that, and so they aren't going to do it. There are representatives of 150 healthcare industries and associations who don't want to start over either. No way. The best they can do is to make the new law work better. So here's my own list, conservative contribution. They lean towards financing and rules changes that make markets work better, including physician payment reform, the end of SGR, pass four bipartisan Medicare reform bills that are already in the works, starting with the passage of the Bipartisan Healthcare Price Transparency Promotion Act, with better than average investment in the science of evaluating what works and doesn't work in clinical systems. Deal once and for all with medical liability by changing the accountability standard to inform patient consent. Change the tax treatment of health insurance by providing everyone an income-related income defined contribution to annual premium cost, which would simplify the employer mandate and might encourage post-retirement contributions as compensation. Reform Part C of Medicare to provide a private health insurance plan pegged to the price of traditional Medicare and end the use of private supplemental insurance. Reform Long-Term Care financing by substituting a private disability insurance mandate as part of health insurance purchase and phase out the use of Medicaid for disability supportive services. Strengthen the definition of unfair competition and antitrust laws administered at the state and the federal level. Whew. You know, it took us 48, 40 years for me to get to this point in this speech. You know, we're not going to do all of that at one time. But I wanted to make the point that uh, while there's still a Democratic president in office, who will go down in history, if for nothing else, he's going to go down in history as having been the person that did what no other president was able to do after a century of trying. They might as well try to deal with him if they want to get something good for America than waiting until after 2016. So what health reform is all about is restoring trusting relationships. And um, I just want to end this little talk so you can ask the questions if you have any uh, about the third inning of the game that, that we are in. <clears throat> By telling you that uh, how important physician leaders are to the building of that trust. Um, I get on these online things, you know, where a bunch of physicians that don't want to change and they use, they hide behind privacy laws and things like that. We have still have the strictest privacy laws in this state of any state. No, they hide behind that sort of thing because they don't want to change. So there's gonna, still going to be something like that. But the vast majority of people who go to all the hard work and the $186,000 of debt and so forth understand if not now, when, if not us, who? This is the time to get this done. And I, so I, we think tonight of Bill Peterson and Dick Fry. And my friends Bob Kelly up in Grand Rapids and Jim Knapp in Detroit Lakes and Roger Gilbertson in Fargo, and I could go on with a long list. And, um, and I'd like to talk about each one of these people in a, in a personal way because they've meant so much to me in my, in my learning about uh, physician leadership. I did talk to Tom Dean, who was a student here once, out in Westington Springs, South Dakota. Some of you may remember Tom. And, um, Tom, for the last uh, seven, eight, nine years, something like that, um, has had a, a, oh, I don't know how rare it is, but he's had a myeloma of a serious nature. And uh, 
he's had transplants and great care from the subspecialists at Avera, which he is, is a part of. And, but he took six years on MedPAC, you know, and was a great member of the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission while he's fighting this off. And uh, he says to me on the phone the other day, he says, I got one of those miracle cancer drugs, you know. It's outrageously expensive. <laughs> but he says, I'm feeling great. I'm doing just great. And then he told me what's going on in South Dakota. You know, South Dakota used to be doctor's heaven, hospital heaven, and the insurance plan just paid the bills. Well, now they got about to have four competitive health plans working in South Dakota. One, of course, belongs to Sanford. One belongs to Avera. But the other one is the, the doctor-owned one, I guess. It's a, some kind of a Blue Cross plan, Dakota Care, I think it's called. But Wel Wellmark is coming up from Iowa because a good part of South Dakota is in Iowa as well. So they're going to have some insurance competition in the state of South Dakota. And Tom says, thank God, because we're finally going to have some focus on performance <laughs> outcomes and on costs in a state in which, for too long, we haven't had that. But he said, people like me, the family practitioners, out here in the boonies <laughs> in South Dakota, are going to get rewarded for the advice that we can provide to people that depend on us for good advice for a change. So all of these people have been incredibly helpful, and, um, but there's been many more. Um, uh, I think of the, uh, the Minnesota graduates from the MHA program. Um, unbelievable. There's nothing like Minnesota hospital administrator program graduates. I mean, I, I, I don't want to begin. I'm not going to name them, but... This is, a, this is a partnership game, right? I mean, it's who's running the system and who are the docs that are the, gonna be the leaders that are gonna make them look good. I gotta tell you just one story, because I am quitting. Um, Rick Norling, uh, you know, Rick went from Fairview to run Premier, and now he's doing lots of other stuff. Great, seems to be really hot on interprofessional education or something like that. But he told me the other day, <coughs> uh, um, he said one of his first jobs as a hospital administrator was in downtown L.A. at the big public hospital down there. And they were trying to figure out, and he's bringing all this eager Minnesota stuff to L.A. And the question is, how do we stop some of these people from just dumping all their problems on us? And he said, well, the answer is, let's get some primary care docs who will, who will take them so they don't have to come to the hospital emergency room with all their problems. So he goes to a doc friend of his by the name of Bob Margolis and says, Bob, here's my idea. And Bob's got a couple of buddies who are also uh, in internal medicine or something like that. So they get this idea. They will set up across the street or something like that their own practice. And they will start taking all these low-income uh, patients into their practice. Well, that was like, what, 30 years ago or something like that. Today, or this earlier this year, Bob Margolis and a couple of his partners sold that company <laughs> to DaVita for $4.1 billion. And Rick Norling didn't get a penny out of that. <laughs> but isn't that a nice memory to carry away from a community like this to a place like LA? Because there's a program like that, and the physician leadership program, and what Connie Delaney is doing in nursing, and what I go on and on and on with, with my list of mentors. So. Uh, I will uh, close by saying that uh, probably my best current mentors are the people in the, in the, it's now core 20, 21, something like that, of the healthcare MBA program, because I love those people and what they produce, because it's a whole other generation. But suffice it to say, the seed's already been planted for all the leadership we need right here. And uh, Dr. Peterson? <laughs> Your legacy will not be your golf game, even though you're pretty good at it until recently. Uh, it's not going to be your Monday night bridge, even though you're also good at that. Uh, might not even be your son, Charlie Peterson, who probably set a record when he left this state to go out in the Rocky Mountains someplace, leaving 3,500 patients behind here in this state, including me, my wife. My brother and his wife. <laughs> Charlie, why did you have to do that to us? 
He was that good a physician. 3,500 of us, that must be a record. So that's not gonna be what we remember you for. It'll be the fact that every year about this time, people like us are gonna gather here. And uh, we're gonna celebrate all the leaders who have invited, enabled, or made connection between their good ideas and practice. Leaders will make us, once again, the national leader in healthy people, healthy communities, and a healthy system, to whom the rest of the world, I can now say, looks with the same admiration we have for you tonight. Thank you very much. Okay, that's my, that's my, that's my ending. <laughs> so, um, I think we promised an opportunity for questions, and anybody wants to stick around for questions? Please. Thank you, uh, Senator Durenberger, that was great. And, um, a lot of in interesting information, some of which we've heard, but some of which is new and a nice perspective. With the Affordable Care Act um, passing, uh, you know and all of us know that there's still a lot of physicians who are opposed to the Affordable Care Act, and um, some on practical grounds, some on philosophic grounds, but one, one major concern about the Affordable Care Act is that it places a lot of reliance on the accountable care organizations, yeah. the ACOs. And I think the hope is that, that that will somehow affect the cost of health care. But a con big concern on the part of some physicians is that within an ACO, the physicians as a part of that have to take on some financial risk or actual insurance risk and that that creates a conflict, a financial or economic conflict with the patient care aspect that, that is always yeah. the prime reason why we as physicians take care of patients. What, what do you see about that conflict? Do you think it's gonna be a concern and how do we deal with that? Yeah, it's, uh, I think, it's, I think it's, a little, it's a legitimate concern. And I skipped a part of this uh, because I noticed what time it was, uh, um, which I, I talked about you know, the fifth, sixth, and seventh inning of the ball game. <laughs> and, and um, you know, right now we're, I guess we're in the top of the third or something like that, and you still buy your health care from insurance companies instead of buying it from, you know, a health organization. I mean, and yet all of our organizations are now called Alina Health, right? And Health Partners and Fairview Health and da 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 okay? So right now, there's, a, there's 15% of every decision, financial decision you make, to buy a doc or buy access to the system, it's going to some third party. It's not going to reward the physician. So the next step in the process is, guess what? If not quite an HMO, <laughs> it's maybe a modified HMO or a accountable care organization or something like, something like that, but it won't be long before you're gonna be buying a membership in a health organization or a health company. Because they're taking the risk now and not getting paid for it, as anybody who's currently in the hospital business, I think, pretty well understands. Um, and they're also taking some of the risks of new ideas and, and things like that. So that's, the, that's where this is leading. Um, and the challenge, of course, is in the administration of it. And how do you get how do you get from here to there, and who showed you how to get there? So that's, that's the expectation. And I wish to God when you ask questions like that, that one of these Democrats, starting with the president, <laughs> had given a speech like this. It didn't have to be 45 minutes long or whatever it was, you know. It was just a one minute thing saying, we're doing something that nobody ever expected us to do as Democrats, <laughs> you know. And I think the whole public would kind of get what's going on, right? <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, any other questions? Or I'll anybody? Stop here. Let me tag on to Lyle's question. What he didn't tell you is that he's uh, as part of the smallest cardiology group in Minnesota. Two people. <laughs> small, innovative, local. You used to quote Tip O'Neill and say all health care is local. Do you worry at all about local innovation uh, with this uh, with the big ACO thing? 
No, no, not at all. Not, um, and I, you know, my, my proof is in a larger, slightly larger one. I think of, if, if you list all the subspecialties that are the hardest to get incorporated into a hospital, you know, cardiologists, yes, it's, you're lucky to be just two guys. Um, is orthopedics. Okay, so my learning curve comes from my guy, my favorite, orth, one of my favorite orthopedic surgeons. Is Ed Kelly still there? Huh? He just left. Okay, well, he missed it then, so I won't include him. But my favorite is, and I've told this to Ed, but uh, is uh, who's with uh, the big one? Yeah, Twin City Orthopedics. Um, it's Mark Schwinkowski at TRIA. So the first time I went to see Mark um, over there, I walk into the hallway and there's a whole bunch of big uh, wheelchairs. You know, they're huge like that. And he, I said, why are they so big? And he says, well, because that's for the Vikings. Oh, I say, that's it. Oh, he said, at least that's what we tell all the suburban moms that come in here, you know. <laughs> but anyway, I got to be serious about this. Um, he took me on a tour of the thing and then he took me to where the informatics section, I mean the computers and all that sort of stuff. And he says, we're starting to keep track of everybody that comes in here, the diagnosis and the outcome, and the tools that they bought and used in this process. That was probably, I don't know, six, seven years ago, something like that. <laughs> now that's TRIA's combination of Fairview and Park, I don't know, Park Nicollet, and I don't know whoever owns them now, but anyway. So now I take him to see his congressman. And to talk to this congressman about what's possible inside specialized, subspecialty organizations, large or small. <clears throat> and um, he says, we've been keeping this data on everything, on all of the, he says, my number one problem here is that everybody in my organization knows who's the two or three or four best surgeons. And they'd love to be just like us. But in a fee-for-service system, you can't persuade them not to do surgery. So you need the data. Now I got the data. Now I have the data that shows what the three best are really doing and what it costs. And here's the data that shows of 16 total hips and 16 total knees, <laughs> you know, all the different manufacturers. Here's the one that works best, not necessarily costs least, but here's the one that work best. And right now, all, whatever it is, 27 or 28 of us, are all going to use the same total hip and the same total knee. And we're going to make this information available to manufacturers. They can come in and use the information. If they think they can come in with something better, great. Now, to me, that's a valuable resource for any healthcare system. You don't need a brand name, <laughs> you know, to sell that kind of a future. No, anybody would want to do business with that kind of, whether it's cardiology or it's orthopedics or whatever it is, anybody should want to do business with those kinds of uh, specialty surgeons. And I hope that's the future, you know, rather than in a line or somebody else is gobbling everybody up, you know. One of the people I admire greatly is Nick Schneeman, <laughs> you know, because he's married, making geriatrics something that even I think is a good idea. Of course, also being 80 years old, I think it's a good idea. But uh, the way Nick tells the story, at least, Ken wanted to buy him out. And he says, I'll sell you 45% of the company. And Ken says, why can't I buy you? And he says, because then you're going to tell me how to run it. Not bad. Not bad. That's a doc you want to admire, right? And I'm sure you are too. But that's, uh, and I, I, I thanks for clarifying that because it gives me an opportunity to tell you why I just don't think there's a model out there for the future. Because I think, I, and because I believe in the genius of a properly motivated and financially rewarded physician and physician specialty, physician organizations. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Are they? Yeah, hmm. relatively big compared to right. national. Uh, and I, I just wonder, how big is too big and how small is too small? Ooh. I mean, what, what's the, 
what's the sort of balance there between having a big system with the sort of monopolistic or power to to gain higher prices and raise healthcare costs versus well i think we have to have the economists answer that question um, what what is um, what is what is too big right now big is uh, fashionable is cuz scale means you can reduce certain costs and stuff like that i don't believe that um, i think there is a too big i think there is a point at which you lose the sense of community um, and uh, you know, so, but I, I, I wouldn't even begin to, to deal with that one. The danger in our community, there's, there's two things that bother me in this community. <clears throat> one of them is <clears throat> we don't have uh, an attorney general, and the FTC is probably too busy right now, and, and DOJ, but we don't have an attorney general to enforce antitrust law. She doesn't even understand it, I don't think. And I, I, I'm not saying that to put her down or anything like that. Uh, but I have, in teaching our classes, uh, Ryan and I have both tried to get to the Attorney General's office to find out what, what's being taught and you know, what's going on over there in antitrust so we could help teach it to people like you. And we never could get through. So I'm going to make some assumption she doesn't know much about antitrust or doesn't want to get into it other than making sure Sanford doesn't get to, to the University of Minnesota. But that's a critical issue. Because as far as what I, if what I can see, for a long time, and this precedes Obamacare and goes back to Dan's day, we have been, you know, people have, because everybody wants to go to a hospital within 15 minutes, you know, and no stoplights or whatever it is. It just feels like through affiliations and things like that, we're, we're trying to cover geographic territory. And I think that's an antitrust problem. I think any good economist would figure out that's a problem. But it's one that at some level, it gets me to my second one, <laughs> that the CEO, at the CEO level, and at the board level probably, the leadership in those big organizations need to start talking to each other about what is competition in this community. What do we want to compete on? Why should we compete on all the standards by which we're going to be judged? I mean, you know, whatever it is. Why, don't, why can't we find some things that we can agree on here? And you need to go someplace like uh, Kathy Coria at Health, Health East, who is, and the whole organization, which has been pared way down, you know, but is trying to do all the right things to see how, in a competitive environment where there aren't any rules, <laughs> that good organizations in the East Metro, like Health East, are going to get pushed out. So, um, but I believe in a not, I have no doubt about this. I think Dick Pettengill probably first planted the seed when the, over the debate on uh, how many children's hospitals do we want or should we have one world-class children's hospital. In a not-for-profit community, you ought to all be able to get together and try to figure that out. Not who gets what, but what do we want in this community and what are we willing to do for the benefits that we would receive to do it. Uh, because the legislature can't figure these things out. The Attorney General won't figure these things out. So I believe in a not-for-profit community where everybody's cheating on community benefit, and they all know it, you know, every one of you knows it. <laughs> um, I asked Dick Pettengill what Tenet has, you know, because Tenet goes through the South. And you can imagine a for-profit hospital system picks up one heck of a lot more unpaid <laughs> uninsured patients than anybody does around here. Except HCMC probably or something like that. So I think you can ride community benefit to getting leadership together to try to shape, you know, what is this competition going to be in this future that we want? Because you're asking, I, I, I sense why you're asking the question and it's an excellent, excellent question to ask. Did that partially answer it? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I, yeah. I just can't picture how all those parties would get together and say, you know, we'll do it this way. I don't know. I had, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, you do it. You, yeah, it's, a, it's an ICSI. It could start with something like you've already got, which an ICSI, it's an ICSI deal, and ICSI community benefit or a community measurement. You get, you get, a, you get some old CEOs like Spinner over there and McLaughlin and some of these guys to call the meeting. And, uh, 
Riley, and um, you know, have them call the meeting. So, I mean, there's lots of ways we can do this. And if nobody's going to blow the whistle, I mean, all you need is the willingness to do it. If nobody's going to blow the whistle on you, it's not going to happen. When Pettengill was here, I tried this once. We had, uh, some of you may remember this, we had 38, 37 or 38 CEOs from the Midwest came together with Paul O'Neill. And our goal was to do something like this. And um, <laughs> it worked really well. Paul O'Neill gave his great speech, and everybody was enthused, and even... Uh, Cortese, what, what the head of Mayo, said, I'm, I, don't have, I don't have Epic. I got, yeah, I had something else, whatever they had. He said, I'll give that up if you guys decide that everybody using the same system is going to be good for this larger community. I'll give up, I'll give up, give it up, and I'll go to this new system. That's how close we got. And then <laughs> two of the CEOs, the current president of the Minnesota Hospital Association, and <laughs> the incoming president of the Minnesota Hospital Association, I won't name names, both, both of them said, that's a hell of a good fish. Um, both, both of them said, well, wait, that's the function of the Hospital Association and so forth, and I looked at Dick and, <laughs> whoops. Jim Reinertson was chairing the meeting and we had every, everything was kind of moving in this direction. And, um, and that was big, I mean, that was Nick Walters from Billings and uh, Mar the Marshfield gang, and you know, there's a bunch of people that were there for that thing. It was, uh, it was going well until <laughs> I think Reinertson called it the elephant in the middle of the room or something like that, and, da, 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 and then these two guys piped up. So, anyway, it's possible. Yes, John. about more and more uh, capitation or through, you know, these in the risk relationships now with physicians. You know, the, if you, if you kind of look at everyone's position right now, the, the people that want the status quo, all right, are, are, are going to not want to have, they do not want change. Because it's, you know, if you're a specialist, it's not in your best interest to be caught in all this stuff. So w when you when you have a vision for how how it is capitation have to to change the incentives properly in I, the delivery. They, I, John, I, I assume they're you know they're um, everybody knows changes is coming. You know, you can't get in the way of it. The question I think you, you were asking a fairness question really, like you know. Uh, you want to design something good and put me out of business in the process, you know, that doesn't make any sense. Because I haven't even had, got a had a chance yet to prove how good I am, <laughs> you know, because I didn't meet your standards. I, it's sort of like the way your question, I think, was headed. Um, but, I, you know, I, I can't believe that there's many other than, there's a generational thing, and you know that better than I probably. There's a generational deal in physicians, you know, and there's, in that group, you know, there's a bunch that aren't quite getting it. But the folks that we teach over here, the younger ones, um, I know, I think they want to change. I think they're just uncomfortable with living from one reform to the next, you know, if nothing else. So I, I don't know, I just, I'm not out there with you all the time, but I just, I just, I'm just so positive about where we Good place the future. to end. Oh, good. Change. All right. Thank you, Senator. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Bill.